Investigative reports. Investigative series. Sustainable debt slavery. In this first installment of a new series, Ian Davis and Whitney Webb explore how the UN's sustainable development policies, the SDGs, do not promote sustainability as most conceive of it and instead utilize the same debt imperialism long used by the Anglo-American empire to entrap nations in a new, equally predatory system of global financial governance. By Ian Davis and B. Whitney Webb. September 13, 2022. 19-minute read. The UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is pitched as a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet, now and into the future. At the heart of this agenda are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Many of these goals sound nice in theory and paint a picture of an emergent global utopia, such as no poverty, no world hunger and reduced inequality. Yet as is true with so much, the reality behind most, if not all, of the SDGs are policies cloaked in the language of utopia that, in practice, will only benefit the economic elite and entrench their power. This can clearly be seen in fine print of the SDGs, as there is considerable emphasis on debt and on entrapping nation-states, especially developing states, in debt as a means of forcing adoption of SDG-related policies. It is then little coincidence that many of the driving forces behind SDG-related policies, at the UN and elsewhere, are career bankers. Former executives at some of the most predatory financial institutions in the history of the world, from Goldman Sachs to Bank of America to Deutsche Bank, are among the top proponents and developers of SDG-related policies. Are their interests truly aligned with sustainable development and improving the state of the world for regular people, as they now claim? Or do their interests lie where they always have, in a profit-driven economic model based on debt slavery and outright theft? In this unlimited hangout investigative series, we will be exploring these questions and interrogating, not only the power structures behind the SDGs and related policies, but also their practical impacts. In this first installment, we will explore what actually underpins the majority of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs, cutting through the flowery language to deliver the full picture of what the implementation of these policies means for the average person. Subsequent installments will focus on case studies based on specific SDGs and their sector-specific impacts. Overall, this series will offer a fact-based and objective look at how the motivation behind the SDGs and Agenda 2030 is about retooling the same economic imperialism used by the Anglo-American Empire in the post-World War II era for the purposes of the coming multipolar world order and efforts to enact a global neo-feudal model, perhaps best summarized as a model for sustainable slavery. The SDG Word Salad the UN educates young people in developing nations to welcome sustainable development without disclosing the impact it will have on their lives or their national economy, source, UNICEF. Most people are aware of the concept of sustainable development but, it is fair to say that the majority believe that SDGs are related to tackling problems allegedly wrought by climate disaster. However, the Agenda 2030 SDGs encompass every facet of our lives and only one. SDG 13, deals explicitly with climate. From economic and food security to education, employment and all business activity, name any sphere of human activity, including the most personal, and there is an associated SDG designed to transform it. Yet, it is the SDG 17, Partnerships for Goals, through which we can start to identify who the beneficiaries of this system really are. The stated UN SDG 17 aim is, in part, to enhance global macroeconomic stability, including through policy coordination and policy coherence. Enhance the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development, complemented by multi-stakeholder partnerships, to support the achievement of the sustainable development goals in all countries. Encourage and promote effective public, public-private and civil society partnerships, building on the experience and resourcing strategies of partnerships. From 
this, we can deduce that multi-stakeholder partnerships are supposed to work together to achieve macroeconomic stability in all countries. This will be accomplished by enforcing policy coordination and policy coherence constructed from the knowledge of public, public-private, and civil society partnerships. These partnerships will deliver the SDGs. This word salad requires some untangling because this is the framework that enables the implementation of every SDG in all countries. Before we do, it is worth noting that the UN often refers to itself and its decisions using grandiose language. Even the most trivial of deliberations are treated as historic or groundbreaking, etc. There is also a lot of fluff to wade through about transparency, accountability, sustainability and so on. These are just words which require corresponding action in order to have contextual meaning. Transparency doesn't mean much if crucial information is buried in endless reams of impenetrable bureaucratic waffle that isn't reported to the public by anyone. Accountability is an anathema if even national governments lack the authority to exercise oversight over the UN, and when sustainable is used to mean transformative, it becomes an oxymoron. Untangling the UNG 3P SDG Word Salad The UN Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, commissioned a paper which defines multi-stakeholder partnerships as P. Partnerships between business, NGOs, governments, the United Nations and other actors. These multi-stakeholder partnerships are supposedly working to create global macroeconomic stability as a prerequisite for the implementation of the SDGs. But, just like the term intergovernmental organization, the meaning of macroeconomic stability has also been transformed by the UN and its specialized agencies. While macroeconomic stability used to mean full employment and stable economic growth, accompanied by low inflation, the UN have announced that isn't what it means today. Economic growth now has to be smart in order to meet SDG requirements. Crucially, fiscal balance, the difference between a government's revenue and expenditure, must accommodate sustainable development by creating fiscal space. This effectively disassociates the term macroeconomic stability from real economic activity. The transformative SDGs, source, UN. Climate change is seen, not just as an environmental problem, but as a serious financial, economic and social problem. Therefore fiscal space must be engineered to finance the policy coordination and policy coherence needed to avert the prophesied disaster. The UN Department for Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, notes that fiscal space lacks a precise definition. While some economists define it simply as the availability of budgetary room that allows a government to provide resources for a desired purpose, others express budgetary room as a calculation based upon a country's debt-to-GDP ratio and projected growth. UNDESA suggests that fiscal space boils down to the estimated, or projected, debt sustainability gap. This is defined as the difference between a country's current debt level and its estimated sustainable debt level. No one knows what events may impact future economic growth. A pandemic or another war in Europe could severely restrict it, or cause a recession. The debt sustainability gap is a theoretical concept based upon little more than wishful thinking. As such, this allows policymakers to adopt a malleable, and relatively arbitrary, interpretation of fiscal space. They can borrow to finance sustainable development spending, irrespective of real economic conditions. The primary objective of fiscal policy used to be to maintain employment and price stability and encourage economic growth through the equitable distribution of wealth and resources. It has been transformed by sustainable development. Now it aims to achieve sustainable trajectories for revenues, expenditures, and deficits that emphasize fiscal space. If this necessitates increased taxation and or borrowing, so be it. Regardless of the impact this has on real economic activity, it's all fine because, according to the World Bank, debt is a critical form of financing for the sustainable development goals.
Ending deficits and increasing debt are not a problem because failure to achieve sustainable development goals would be far more unacceptable and would increase debt even further. Any amount of sovereign debt can be heaped upon the taxpayer in order to protect us from the much more dangerous economic disaster that would allegedly befall us if the SDGs aren't quickly implemented. In other words, economic, financial and monetary crises will hardly be absent in the world of sustainable development. The rationale outlined above will likely be used to justify such crises. This is the model envisioned by the UN and its multi-stakeholder partners. For those behind the SDGs, the ends justify the means. Any travesty can be justified as long as it is committed in the name of sustainability. We are faced with a global policy initiative, affecting every corner of our lives, based upon the logical fallacy of circular reasoning. The effective destruction of society is necessary in order to protect us from something that we are told is to be much worse. Obedience is a virtue because, unless we adhere to the policy demands imposed upon us, and accept the costs, the climate disaster might come to pass. Armed with this knowledge, it becomes much easier to translate the convoluted UNG 3P word salad and figure out what the UN actually means by the term sustainable development. Governments will tax their populations, increasing deficits and national debt where necessary, to create financial slush funds that private multinational corporations, philanthropic foundations, and NGOs can access in order to distribute their SDG compliance based products, services, and policy agendas. The new SDG markets will be protected by government sustainability legislation, which is designed by the same partners who profit from and control the new global SDG based economy. Green Debt Traps The International Monetary Fund, IMF, headquarters building in Washington, D.C., source, Brookings. Debt is specifically identified as a key component of SDG implementation, particularly in the developing world. In a 2018 paper written by a joint World Bank IMF team, it was noted on several occasions that debt vulnerabilities in developing economies are being addressed by those financial institutions within the context of the global development agenda, example, SDGs. That, that same year, the World Bank and IMF's Debt Sustainability Framework, DSF, became operational. Per the World Bank, the DSF allows creditors to tailor their financing terms in anticipation of future risks and helps countries balance the need for funds with the ability to repay their debts. It also guides countries in supporting the SDGs, when their ability to service debt is limited. Expressed differently, if countries cannot pay the debt they incur through IMF loans and World Bank, an associated multilateral development bank, financing, they will be offered options to repay their debt through implementing SDG-related policies. However, as future installments of this series will show, many of these options supposedly tailored to SDG implementation actually follow the debt for land swap model, now retooled as debt for conservation swaps or debt for climate swaps, that precede the SDGs and Agenda 2030 by a number of years. This model essentially enables land grabs and land natural resource theft on a scale never before seen in human history. Since their creation in the aftermath of World War II, both the World Bank and IMF have historically used debt to force countries, mostly in the developing world, to adopt policies that favor the global power structure. This was made explicit in a leaked U.S. Army document written in 2008 which states that these institutions are used as unconventional, financial weapons in times of conflict up to and including large-scale general war and as weapons in terms of influencing the policies and cooperation of state governments. The document notes that these institutions in particular have a long history of conducting economic warfare valuable to any ASOF, Army Special Operations Forces, UW, Unconventional Warfare, campaign. The document further notes that these financial weapons can be used by the U.S. military to create financial incentives or disincentives to persuade adversaries, allies, and surrogates to modify their behavior at the theater strategic, operational, and tactical levels. 
Further, these unconventional warfare campaigns are highly coordinated with the State Department and the intelligence community in determining which elements of the human terrain in UWOA, unconventional warfare operations area, are most susceptible to financial engagement. Notably, the World Bank and the IMF are listed as both financial instruments and diplomatic instruments of U.S. national power as well as integral parts of what the manual calls the current global governance system. While they were once financial weapons to be wielded by the Anglo-American empire, the current shifts in the global governance system also herald a shift in who is able to weaponize the World Bank and IMF for their explicit benefit. As the sun sets on the imperial, unipolar model and the dawn of a multipolar world order is upon us. The World Bank and IMF have already been brought under the control of a new international power structure following the creation of the UN-backed Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, GFANS, in 2021. At the COP26 conference that same year, GFANS announced plans to overhaul the role of the World Bank and IMF specifically as part of a broader plan aimed at transforming the global financial system. This was made explicit by GFAN's principal and BlackRock CEO Larry Fink during a COP26 panel, where he specified the plan to overhaul these institutions, saying, If we're going to be serious about climate change in the emerging world, we're going to have to really focus on the reimagination of the World Bank and the IMF. GFANZ's plans to reimagine these international financial institutions involve merging them with the private banking interests that compose GFANS, creating a new system of global financial governance, and eroding national sovereignty, particularly in the developing world, by forcing them to establish business environments deemed friendly to the interests of GFANS members. As noted in a previous Unlimited Hangout report, GFAN seeks to use the World Bank and related institutions to globally impose massive and extensive deregulation on developing countries by using the decarbonization push as justification. No longer must MDBs, multilateral development banks, entrap developing nations in debt to force policies that benefit foreign and multinational private sector entities, as climate change-related justification can now be used for the same ends. GFAN's Progress Report November 2021 Download Debt remains the main weapon in the arsenal of the World Bank and IMF, and will be used for the same imperial ends, only now with different benefactors and a different array of policies to impose on their prey, the SDGs. The UN's Quiet Revolution GFANS is a significant driver of sustainable development. It is, nonetheless, just one of many SDG-related public-private partnerships. The GFANS website states, GFANS provides a forum for leading financial institutions to accelerate the transition to a net-zero global economy. Our members currently include more than 450 member firms from across the global financial sector, representing more than $130 trillion in assets under management. GFANS is formed from a number of alliances. The banks, asset managers, asset owners, insurers, financial service providers and investment consultancies each have their own global partnership networks that collectively contribute to the GFANS forum. For example, the UN's Net Zero Banking Alliance affords Citigroup, Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, HSBC and others the opportunity to pursue their ideas through the GFANS forum. They are among the key stakeholders in the SDG transformation. In order to accelerate the transition, the GFANS Forum's call to action empowers these multinational corporations to stipulate specific policy requests. They have decided that governments should adopt economy-wide net-zero targets. Governments also need to RF form financial regulations to support the net-zero transition, Phase out of fossil fuel subsidies, pre e carbon emissions, man that e net zero transition plans, and set climate reporting for public and private enterprises by 2024. All of this is necessary, we are told, to avert the climate disaster that might happen one day. Therefore, this global financial governance policy agenda is simply unavoidable, and we should allow private and historically predatory 
financial institutions to create policy aimed at deregulating the very markets in which they operate. After all, the race to net zero must happen at breakneck speed and, per G fans, the only way to win involves scaling private capital flows to emerging and developing economies like never before. Were the flow of this private capital to be impeded by existing regulations or other obstacles, it would surely spell planetary destruction. King Charles III explained the new global SDG economy that will relegate elected governments to enabling partners. Then titled Prince Charles, speaking at COP26, in preparation for the GFAN's announcement, he said. My plea today is for countries to come together to create the environment that enables every sector of industry to take the action required. We know this will take trillions, not billions of dollars. We also know that countries, many of whom are burdened by growing levels of debt, simply cannot afford to go green. Here we need a vast military-style campaign to marshal the strength of the global private sector, with trillions at its disposal far beyond global GDP, beyond even the governments of the world's leaders. It offers the only real prospect of achieving fundamental economic transition. Just as the alleged urgency to implement the SDGs exonerates public policymakers, it also lets the private sector, that drives the antecedent policy agendas, off the hook. The fact that the debt they collectively create primarily benefits private capital is just a coincidence, an allegedly inescapable, consequence of creating the fiscal space needed to deliver sustainable development. The UN's increasing reliance upon these multi-stakeholder partnerships is the result of the quiet revolution that occurred in the UN during the 1990s. In 1998, then UN Secretary General, Kofi Annan, told the World Economic Forum's Davos Symposium. The business of the United Nations involves the businesses of the world. We also promote private sector development and foreign direct investment. We help countries to join the international trading system and enact business-friendly legislation. Kofi Annan, Secretary General, United Nations, 1997-2006, is a member of the Foundation Board of the World Economic Forum and co-chair of the World Economic Forum on Africa. Here, he speaks at the opening plenary on Africa and the new global economy at the World Economic Forum on Africa 2009 in Cape Town, South Africa, source, WEF. The 2017 UN General Assembly Resolution 7224, a Res 7224, decreed that the UN would work tirelessly for the full implementation of this agenda, Agenda 2030, through the global dissemination of concrete policies and actions. In keeping with Anand's admission, these enacted policies and actions are designed, via global financial governance, to be business-friendly. A Res 7224 added that the UN would maintain the strong political commitment to address the challenge of financing and creating an enabling environment at all levels for sustainable development. p. Articularly with regard to developing partnerships through the provision of greater opportunities to the private sector, non-governmental organizations, and civil society in general, in particular in the pursuit of sustainable development SDGs. This enabling environment is synonymous with the fiscal space demanded by the World Bank and other UN specialized agencies. The term also makes an appearance in the GFAN's progress report, which states that the World Bank and multilateral development banks should be used to prompt developing nations to create the right high-level, cross-cutting enabling environments for alliance members' investments in those nations. This concept was firmly established in 2015 at the Addis Ababa Action Agenda Conference on Financing for Development. The gathered delegates from 193 UN nation states committed their respective populations to an ambitious financial investment program to pay for sustainable development. They collectively agreed to create an enabling environment at all levels for sustainable development to further strengthen the framework to finance sustainable development. The enabling environment is a government, and therefore taxpayer-funded commitment to SDGs, Anand's successor and the ninth Secretary-General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, authorized a 2017 report on ARES 7224 which read. 
The United Nations must urgently rise to the challenge of unlocking the full potential of collaboration with the private sector and other partners. T. The United Nations system recognizes the need to further pivot towards partnerships that more effectively leverage private sector resources and expertise. The United Nations is also seeking to play a stronger catalytic role in sparking a new wave of financing and innovation needed to achieve the goals, SDGs. While called an intergovernmental organization, the UN is not just a collaboration between governments. Some might reasonably argue that it never was. The UN was created, in no small measure, thanks to the efforts of the private sector and the philanthropic arms of oligarchs. For instance, the Rockefeller Foundation's RF's, Comprehensive Financial and Operational Support for the Economic, Financial and Transit Department EFTD, of the League of Nations LON, and its considerable influence upon the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration UNRI, arguably made the RF the key player in the transition of the LON into the UN. In addition, the Rockefeller family which has long promoted internationalist policies that expand and entrench global governance, donated the land on which the UN's headquarters in New York sits, among other sizable donations to the UN over the years. It should come as little surprise that the UN is particularly fond of one of their main donors and has long partnered with the RF and praised the organization as a model for global philanthropy. The Five Rockefeller Brothers Left to Right, David, Winthrop, John D. Rockefeller III, Nelson and Lawrence, Source, World Finance. The UN was essentially founded upon a public-private partnership model. In 2000, the Executive Committee of the UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, published private sector involvement and cooperation with the United Nations system. The United Nations and the private sector have always had extensive commercial links through the procurement activities of the former. The United Nations market provides a springboard for a company to introduce its goods and services to other countries and regions. The private sector has also long participated, directly or indirectly, in the normative and standard-setting work of the United Nations. Being able to influence, not only government procurement, but also the development of new global markets and the regulation of the same is, obviously, an extremely attractive proposition for multinational corporations and investors. Unsurprisingly, UN projects that utilize the public-private model are the favored approach of the world's leading capitalists. For instance, it has long been the favored model of the Rockefeller family, who often finance such projects through their respective philanthropic foundations. In the years since its inception, public-private partnerships have expanded to become dominant within the UN system, particularly with regard to sustainable development. Successive secretary-generals have overseen the UN's formal transition into the United Nations Global Public-Private Partnership, UNG3P. As a result of this transformation, the role of nation-state governments at the UN has also changed dramatically. For instance, in 2005, the World Health Organization, WHO, another specialized agency of the UN, published a report on the use of information and communication technology, ICT, in healthcare titled Connecting for Health. Speaking about how stakeholders could introduce ICT healthcare solutions globally, the WHO noted. Governments can create an enabling environment and invest in equity, access and innovation. King Charles III noted last year in Glasgow, governments of democratic nation have been given the role of enabling partners. Their job is to create the fiscal environment in which their private sector partners operate. Sustainability policies are developed by a global network comprised of governments, multinational corporations, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, civil society organizations and other actors. The other actors are predominantly the philanthropic foundations of individual billionaires and immensely wealthy family dynasties, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates, BMGF, or the Rockefeller Foundations. Collectively, these actors constitute the multi-stakeholder partnership. During the pseudo-pandemic, 
Many came to acknowledge the influence of the BMGF over the WHO, but they are just one of many other private foundations that are also valued UN stakeholders. The UN is, itself, a global collaboration between governments and a multinational infragovernmental network of private stakeholders. The foundations, NGOs, civil society organizations and global corporations represent an infragovernmental network of stakeholders, just as powerful, if not more so, than any power block of nation-states. Public-Private Partnership, an Ideology The UN and the WEF, which bills itself as the premier global promoter of public-private partnerships, signed a strategic framework in June 2019, source, WEF. In 2016, UN DESA published a working paper investigating the value of public-private partnerships, G3PS, for achieving the SDGs. The lead author, Jomo Kayes, was the Assistant Secretary-General in the United Nations System Responsible for Economic Research, 2005-2015. UN DESA broadly found that G3PS, in their current form, were not fit for purpose. C. E. Lames of reduced cost and efficient delivery of services through G3PS, to save taxpayers money and benefit consumers were mostly empty and ideological assertions. G3P, projects were more costly to build and finance, provided poorer quality services and were less accessible, moreover, many essential services were less accountable to citizens when private corporations were involved. Investors in G3PS face a relatively benign risk, penalty clauses for non-delivery by private partners are less than rigorous, the study questioned whether risk was really being transferred to the private partners in these projects. T. He evidence suggests that G3PS have often tended to be more expensive than the alternative of public procurement while in a number of instances they have failed to deliver the envisaged gains in quality of service provision. Citing the work of Whitfield, 2010, which examined G3PS in Europe, North America, Australia, Russia, China, India, and Brazil, UN DESA noted that these led to the buying and selling schools and hospitals like commodities in a global supermarket. The UN DESA reports also reminded the UN's G3P enthusiasts that numerous intergovernmental organizations had found G3PS wanting. Evaluations done by the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, IMF, and European Investment Bank, EIB, the organizations normally promoting G3PS have found a number of cases where G3PS did not yield the expected outcome and resulted in a significant rise in government fiscal liabilities. Little has changed since 2016 and yet the UN G3P insists that public-private partnership is the only way to achieve SDGs, ignoring the assessment from its own investigators, in General Assembly Resolution 74 halves, a rest 74-2 the UN declared. UN member states recognize the need for strong global, regional and national partnerships for sustainable development goals, which engage all relevant stakeholders to collaboratively support the efforts of member states to achieve health-related sustainable development goals, including universal health coverage, UHC 2030. The inclusion of all relevant stakeholders is one of the core components of health system governance. We reaffirm General Assembly Resolution 69313 to address the challenge of financing and creating an enabling environment at all levels for sustainable development. We will provide sustainable finances while improving their effectiveness through domestic, bilateral, regional and multilateral channels including partnerships with the private sector and other relevant stakeholders. This UN commitment to global public-private partnership is an ideological assertion and is not based upon the available evidence. In order for G3PS to actually function as claimed, UN DESA stipulated that a number of structural changes would need to be put in place first. These included careful identification of where a G3P could work. UN DESA found that G3PS may be suited to some infrastructure projects but were damaging to projects dealing with public health, education or the environment. 
The UN researchers stated that diligent oversight and regulation of pricing and the alleged transfer of risk would be required, comprehensive and transparent fiscal accounting systems were needed, better reporting standards should be developed and rigorous legal and regulatory safeguards were necessary. None of the required structural or policy changes recommended in the UN DASA 2016 report have been implemented. Sustainability for whom? Agenda 2030 marks the waypoint along the path to Agenda 21. Publicly launched at the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, Section 8 explained how sustainable development would be integrated into decision-making. The primary need is to integrate environmental and developmental decision-making processes. Countries will develop their own priorities in accordance with their national plans, policies, and programs. Sustainable development has been integrated with every policy decision. Not only does every country have a national sustainability plan, these have devolved to local government. It is a global strategy to extend the reach of global financial institutions into every corner of the economy and society. Policy will be controlled by the bankers and the think tanks that infiltrated the environmental movement decades ago. No community is free of global financial governance. Simply put, sustainable development supplants decision-making at the national and local level with global governance. It is an ongoing, and thus far successful, global coup. But more than this, it is a system for global control. Those of us who live in developed nations will have our behavior changed as a psychological and economic war is waged against us to force our compliance. Developing nations will be kept in penury as the fruits of modern industrial and technological development are denied to them. Instead they will be burdened with the debt foisted upon them by the global centers of financial power, their resources pillaged, their land stolen and their assets seized, all in the name of sustainability. Yet it is perhaps the financialization of nature, inherent to sustainable development, that is the greatest danger of all. The creation of natural asset classes, converting forests into carbon sequestration initiatives and water sources into human settlement services. As subsequent installments of this series will show, several SDGs have financializing nature at their core. As openly stated by the UN, sustainable development is all about transformation, not necessarily sustainability as most people conceive of it. It aims to transform the earth and everything on it, including us, into commodities, the trading of which will form the basis of a new global economy. Though it is being sold to us as sustainable, the only thing this new global financial system will sustain is the power of a predatory financial elite. Central Central Banks IMF SDG SDG Series Sustainable Development WEF World Bank Author Ian Davis Ian Davis is an independent investigative journalist, author and blogger from the UK. His focus is upon widening readers' awareness of evidence that the so-called mainstream media won't report. A frequent contributor to UK column, Ian's work has been featured by The Off Guardian, The Corbett Report, Technocracy News, Lou Rockwell and other independent news outlets. You can read more of his work on his blog, https colon double forward slash iandavis.com. Author Whitney Webb Whitney Webb has been a professional writer, researcher and journalist since 2016. She has written for several websites and, from 2017 to 2020, was a staff writer and senior investigative reporter for Mint Press News. She currently writes for The Last American Vagabond and Unlimited Hangout.